welcome to veterinary medicine in the state of Massachusetts. On behalf of the Massachusetts Veterinary Medical Association, we invite you into our world. I am Dr. Monica Mansfield, and I am a small animal practitioner in Medway, Massachusetts. During this program, we will give you a glimpse into the field of veterinary medicine by bringing you to the workplace of veterinarians of many types, including large animal doctors, specialty doctors, pathologists, public health doctors, and veterinary educators. It's a dedicated group of professionals committed to the care of animals' health and public health. We love what we do. What would a day be without animals? We will first bring you to a small animal practice, the Medway Animal Hospital, where Dr. Merrill Cardin will teach us about a typical day as a dog and cat doctor. My job as a small animal veterinarian is very varied and it consists of lots of different things, which is why I think it's so much fun. When an animal is not feeling well, the owners usually bring them in for the vets to look at it. And that's where we become sort of the pet detectives. We have to listen to their heart, take their temperature, ask a whole bunch of questions about whether or not they have vomiting, diarrhea, itchy skin, whether they seem painful in any way. We perform various tests, blood tests, x-rays, and all kinds of diagnostics to try to figure out what's wrong with them since they can't talk to us and tell us. We also perform wellness examinations. Now those are examinations that the owners usually do yearly and we look at dogs and cats, adult and puppies and kittens, and we look at their eyes, their ears, their nose, their mouth, listen to their heart, make sure their body condition is okay, and also a big part of that is to educate the clients. Now the way we educate the animal owners is we tell them all about the different things they have to watch for in their animals. They have to watch for ectoparasites like fleas and ticks, endoparasites like worms, and all kinds of problems such as vomiting and diarrhea. The third part of my job consists of doing surgeries, and I do a lot of spays and neuters and all kinds of other procedures such as taking out bladder stones, taking off growths, tumors off of animals, and we also do a lot of dental care, and we do dentals while the animal is asleep because they can't be awake during, during that particular process. I think they would, they would be too scared. Sometimes pets will come in and they are very, very sick or they've gotten into an accident. They might have fallen or gotten hit by a car. And when that happens, my day becomes very, very hectic. We have to figure out very quickly what's wrong and give the animal the urgent care that they need. What's unique with our practice is that we are focused on the entirety of animals and the context within which animals exist within family settings. I like to remind clients that the care of a pet on the part of a child is one of the most important learning tools that a parent has to help a child become somewhat other-centered, to be somewhat nurturing, nurturing in nature, and to recognize within themselves that um, we're part of an interwoven cycle of life, and uh, our relationship with, with an animal is oftentimes the, at the foundation of that, uh, that coming into fruition. I have been a small animal practitioner for over 30 years and I still love every day that I come to work and I love taking care of the animals. Um, I love the people and helping them with their, their problems with the animals and I love not knowing what I'm going to do each day. I wake up in the morning and I know that I'm going to be with animals and with the people that love them but beyond that I have not a clue and that's very exciting. Some veterinarians choose to tend to large animals these doctors love to be outside with the animals and find great fulfillment helping the large ones. Dr. John Perdrize from the Sanctuary Animal Clinic in Holyoke will show us a day on the job as a mixed animal practitioner. My name is Dr. John Perdrize. I live in western Massachusetts in the town of Holyoke and my clinic is the Sanctuary Animal Clinic. I will do both large and small animal. I usually split up the day 
um, doing small animal one part and the other part large and it varies depending on which day of the week it is whether I'm doing large in the morning or small. When I'm doing the small animal I usually have one technician in the room with me doing it. The rest of the day on the road sometimes the technician comes with me most of the time I'm on my own. I leave in the afternoon on a Monday afternoon say around 1 and Depending on the time of the year, I come home somewhere between 5.30 and 9.30 at night. And those days when I'm on large animal, um, I take care of just about every species there is out in Western Massachusetts. That's cows, horses, sheep, goats, llamas, alpacas, an occasional pig. Um, and when I'm on the farms, it's everything from wellness to emergency work. And a typical day could include a horse farm where I'll do vaccinations, um, take a look at sick horses, an animal that on that particular farm may have had a case of laminitis or uveitis in the past and they'll want me to recheck that animal to see how well it's doing. At the same time that we're taking a look at the other animals and making sure that they are healthy and vaccinating them. Occasionally taking blood samples um, to test for various diseases. Lyme's disease is a big problem in our area. Ehrlichiosis is a problem and we'll take blood samples and test for these diseases. We'll also do routine um, dental care on, on a lot of the species, and particularly horses. They usually need it at least once a year, often twice a year, depending on the mouth of the particular horse. We do everything from miniature horses right on up to draft horses when we're doing that. In my own case, I, I love animals, and that is probably the number one motivator for why I do what I do. And I've found, particularly for myself, that being around the animals has made me the happy person I want to be. Every veterinarian has a different temperament. Some of us love to be in the hospital doing surgery all day. Some of us love to monitor anesthesia. I particularly found for myself that to be in one room all day looking at animals, even though I love animals and I love my clients, can be a bit much. I need to be outside, I need to be in contact with nature, and one of the nice parts about large animal, part of my practice, is you are out there in the nature, out there in the elements. If it's raining, it's raining on you. If it's sunshine, it's a, it can be a beautiful day. And, um, and there's nothing that beats a, a beautiful fall day in western Massachusetts out in the field. I mean, you can't do any better than that. General practitioners often need to consult with veterinary specialists who provide advanced knowledge and skills in their chosen specialty. These are veterinarians who have completed further training and testing beyond their veterinary degree to become board certified in their certain field. These are the doctors who see everyone's extra challenging cases and they have advanced skills and imaging equipment to diagnose and manage many illnesses or surgical conditions. A veterinary surgeon is someone who's completed additional training beyond veterinary school, usually uh, an internship and a residency, so you're talking at least four more years after veterinary school to get this extra training to be able to do the more complicated and difficult surgical procedures that a veterinarian in general practice would usually not want to get involved in, so that's where we step in. Today we're doing a surgery that's very common for orthopedic uh, surgeons in veterinary medicine, and that's repairing a dog's knee that has a torn ligament. Madison is our patient today, and she tore her anterior cruciate ligament. This is a very common problem for our veterinary patients. What we're gonna do today is a surgery to correct the instability that's resulted from the torn ligament. For me, the, the greatest part of what I do is that I'm able to work with the dogs and cats. Um, I enjoy being able to help them. They depend on us, they trust us, and I like to return that trust by helping them in any way I can. That's where I get my greatest pleasure is, is when my patients go home feeling better. The other part of my job that's very special to me is that I'm in a position to take my own dog, Annie, with me and have her be with me everywhere I go, including in the surgery room. She's asleep in the corner while I'm doing my procedures. She's at the patient's cage when they're waking up and she consoles them. She's my little adopted chocolate lab. 
She's about 11 years old now and she's had a rough background but I found her about five years ago and ever since then she's been my best friend. As a neurologist, the type of cases that we see are animals that have seizures or animals that are having trouble walking. So those are probably about 90% of what they come in through the door. So seizures, personality changes, uh, weakness, knuckling or scuffing of the back limbs. And then as a neurologist, once we figure out what's wrong with that animal, whether it needs back surgery or brain surgery or whether it has meningitis or encephalitis, as a neurologist, I can help take them into that the treatment of those diseases, which is often a little beyond what most general practitioners want to get involved with. Being a neurologist, my favorite tool that's available to us at MassFet is the MRI. We've got a new uh, 1.5 Tesla MR scanner that I think is, is pretty neat. The other diagnostic things that we have here are CT scan, ultrasound, um, video endoscopy, video otoscopy. The underwater treadmill, the physical therapy is a newer addition to veterinary medicine in the past five years and has been really the, the cherry on the sundae or you know just the icing on the cake for helping animals with um, post-operative rehabilitation. So those are some pretty neat things that we offer here. For our patients we can really offer anything that they would offer in a human oncology facility. We have radiation therapy, we have chemotherapy, and we have um, surgeons as well. So pretty much it's very similar to how people are treated for cancer. There are several types of cancers that are very responsive to chemotherapy. Lymphoma tends to be one of the more common cancers we see and that many of our patients will respond well and have a good quality of life. There's some cancers where we know a lot about, just like in people, there's a lot of cancers that we have very good success with chemotherapy and or radiation and as well as surgery. And then there's some where we don't know as much and so we get into more uh, the clinical trial type uh, treatments where we do participate in some studies that they're open and available, we, we're able to provide that for our patients as well. The dogs and cats seem to tolerate chemotherapy much better than we do. A lot of that may be uh, related to the different dosing schemes that we use and um, our goals of, of our treatment. With radiation, um, we typically um, see similar side effects as, as we do in people with you know, the skin, um, some changes on the skin in different areas, but that's a very localized treatment. We tend not to see more systemic effects with radiation such as um, radiation sickness, nausea, vomiting, and things on that level. A veterinary pathologist is a person who studies the diseases that occur in animals, uh, the interactions um, between infectious diseases, degenerative diseases, metabolic diseases, and how those affect not only animal health, um, but also how that can translate to affect and hopefully help human health. I chose to become a veterinary pathologist because when I went to vet school, I thought what was really most fascinating was understanding how the diseases worked and, and processed in each animal. And really the best way to understand that is to understand the pathology that underlies each disease. And for what we do, the best thing to do is to look at the histo slide, or the histology slide, and say, uh, this animal is, is affected with X, Y, or Z disease. And then go back to the practitioner and say, well, you know, this is what we can do to hopefully treat that, um, and then kind of formulate a plan from there. The basic progression of a sample being submitted to a pathologist is that, say, a dog comes in with a, with a mass on its leg. The clinician will then biopsy or excise that mass and submit it to a pathologist, whoever their referring pathologist is. So the pathologist then processes the tissue, which means that it gets fixed and it gets made into a, a, a slide. The pathologist then looks at it and renders a diagnosis. A report is then developed and sent to the clinician. The whole process can take seven to ten days but from, when the, from when the biopsy or um, mass is submitted to when the final report goes out. Um, and then once the report goes out, it's, it's a crosstalk between the clinician and the pathologist to, to talk more about the case, if there are any confusing variables or anything else, additional information that may have developed over the last couple of days. I grew up in the military. My father was a, a career army officer. I started out on a different path uh, as an infantry officer, actually. Um, but I always wanted to be a veterinarian, so um, I didn't get into veterinary school the first time around, actually. So I got into medical school, so I didn't get into veterinary school. So, so I went off and was in, in an uh, MD, PhD, and, uh, but I finally got into veterinary school, so I switched over. 
Veterinarians are the Department of Defense representative for all the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, and they're, they're an integral part of the Army Medical Department, and their job is health of the soldier and his family, basically. Another big area is animal care. A lot of people, you know, always say, why, why do you have veterinarians in the Army? And we do take care of military and working animals. I get involved in that quite a bit in Afghanistan, taking care of working dogs. Um, we take care of pets, um, mostly uh, in terms of providing, you know, health and welfare for the soldier, but also to prevent zoonotic disease transmission and whatnot. So we do that. They're involved with food inspection. Every bit of food that's consumed in the military, whether it's at a commissary, at a snack bar, at a, a military installation, is inspected by U.S. Army Veterinary Services. Every plant in the United States that provides food to the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines is actually inspected by a veterinarian. And uh, I did a little bit of that very early in my career. Research is a really big part of the Army Medical Department. Um, in fact, the last commander of USAMRID, which is United States Institute for uh, Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, Maryland, which is the only other level four containment facility besides the one in CDC in Atlanta is at Fort Detrick. And the last commander, that was a friend of mine who was a colonel in the Army Veterinary Service, not a medical officer, but a, a veterinary officer. There's several Army labs across the world, uh, Kuala Lumpur and uh, Nairobi, and Army veterinarians do a lot of research. There's, um, there's a lot of specialties in the Army. Um, we do a lot of uh, infectious disease, tropical disease research, so that's, that's another field. My job was primarily as a preventive medicine officer in special operations, uh, special forces groups and civil affairs groups, um, both active duty and reserve. So I was a slightly different niche than the average Army veterinarian, but I did a little bit of all those things. Shelter medicine is a special skill that requires a special person. Dr. Marvelin Allen Motamid works at the Boston Municipal Shelter facility where she tends to lost or abandoned animals found in the city of Boston and tries to reunite them with their owners when possible and care for the ones that don't have homes. She has a tough job with sometimes difficult decisions to make, but she loves helping animals in this important way. My main um, job here is to oversee the medical care of the animals, all the animals that come to the shelter, and we basically serve the, the stray animals mostly. We do have some owner surrenders here, but mainly um, most of the animals are stray animals. An average day for me will be to come in, walk through the facility, make sure there aren't any um, issues that happened overnight because the animal control officers, they are on 24-hour call, so they may bring animals overnight. So I walk through the facility, make sure that all the animals are okay. And after I do that, we vaccinate the animals that are new admissions. Sometimes animals may need to be treated. Um, those are dealt with. Sometimes animal control officers come in with an emergency and I deal with those um, as I see fit. If there is anything that I can't deal with here, I send them to another facility. After all that is done, then they go up to adoption. And once they go into adoption, they stay in adoption until they are adopted. There are times when animals may, certain personality traits might come out while they're in adoption, and we deal with that as well as we could. But basically, we've had some animals stay in adoption for months and months and months. But usually the small, cute ones, they get adopted within days. I worked at the Animal Rescue League of Boston before going to vet school, and I remember thinking this is what I want to do. I want to talk to people and teach people that were, um, you know, probably in a different economic stance from, from most other people about their animals. I really wanted to have that contact and have that, you know, that, that level of, of care for the animals and for the people. So I, I knew that I wanted to do shelter medicine before I even went to vet school. After vet school, I worked for private practice and as part of that private practice, my responsibility was to work with the City of Boston Animal Shelter. And I just, it just drew me to, because, you know, it was one of the things that I knew that I wanted to do. It was more rewarding. It, it, it satisfied what I needed from veterinary medicine. All veterinarians need to first learn their skill in school. We are so fortunate to have here in Massachusetts an outstanding veterinary college in Grafton at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. We will meet an emerging new doctor going through her coursework. 
experience some of the clinicians in action behind the clinic doors and meet Dean Cochiever. I think the best thing we have going at the School of Veterinary Medicine are the people who work here. Not only the faculty and staff, but the students. And I say they work here, but they're obviously also our students. So we get a very talented group of uh, applicants to the veterinary program. They come not only from Massachusetts, half of our class comes from Massachusetts and the other half from across the country, but they're very well qualified, very motivated, bring lots of interesting background experiences. So we get people not only that are pre-veterinary, but also folks who come from second careers, who've come back that were engineers, that were musicians. So we have a diverse pool um, and we love to encourage a diverse pool. Our faculty and staff um, also come with a, a wide range of talents. We have four different clinics. We have uh, our main teaching hospital, which is, uh, houses both our small animal and our equine enterprise. We have our food animal facility that's in Woodstock, Connecticut. And then we also have a wildlife clinic, which is kind of a unique feature of our school. And then we also have a, a, a specialty practice in, in Walpole that is run by the school, but uh, our students train there as well. And so all of our faculty and staff that run those different facilities come with specialties that range from uh, large animal surgery to anesthesia to radiology to emergency critical care is an enormous uh, area that we have at the school. It's a, probably the largest training program in the country for small animal emergency medicine. So the people that power all that, and of course the staff are there every step of the way in all those areas, they're really what make the school special. Really the reason that I'm at Tufts is to teach. I can do the medical part of my job a lot, a lot of other places um, at a big referral hospital, but I'm pretty active in the second, third, and fourth year of their curriculum. I teach them about things like antibiotics and electrolytes early on, and um, once they get to fourth year, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one situation or small group teaching where we're really trying to teach them the skills that they need once they graduate. On a weekday, we average about 30 to 40 emergencies. On weekends, we can see as many as 50 to 60. And we're really lucky that we have such a big caseload because it gives us a lot of uh, patients that we can teach with. And so we never lack for patients when it comes to teaching our students. To get into vet school, it's pretty intense. Um, I went to University of New Hampshire, which lines it up very well and tells you what you need to take. Um, and you just take a lot of core science classes, a few animal science classes, but mainly organic chemistry, biology, chemistry, um, everything you can think of in that respect. Now that I'm in school, what is the curriculum like? It's very, very intense, and undergrad cannot in any way <laughs> prepare you for that. The first year is a lot of, again, more core-based science classes, like gross anatomy and physio, and. Um, physiological chemistry, things that get you prepared for understanding how the body systems work. And now that we're in third year, we get to do a lot of clinical, hands-on, more of the fun stuff. Today started at 8 o'clock um, with Dr. Matsis teaching us to do a mirror palpation lab. Um, we did a rectal and vaginal palpation of a mirror and took cytology and um, culture samples looked at those under the microscope and we just finished that. And then we have um, zoological medicine from one to three, and then theriogenology from three to five. And that's a typical third year day. You pretty much go to class from eight in the morning until five at night. They work your way into it. First year you feel like it's so hard, but you actually look back and you're not really going to that long of classes. And then second year is a little bit more and third year you're ready for it by then, I think. Well, I've been teaching here since uh, about 1994. Large animal medicine, mostly um, farm animals, dairy cows and horses, small ruminants, sheep and goats. And most of our students have not had much experience with those uh, type of species. So it's a great chance to teach them uh, as much as I know about large animal medicine, farm animal medicine, and to see them become um, enthusiastic about actually going into that type of practice. So few of our students actually go into large animal medicine, so that's uh, very uh, gratifying to see. And it's just knowing that um, many of these will, students will go on to do um, great things as they graduate. And having been a part of that is uh, um, my small reward. A veterinary degree gives uh, lots of latitude. It can be from small animal to large animal can be even in government relations, can be uh, with very uh, 
from the smallest of animals of lab an animal medicine uh, to the largest in zoo animal medicine. Uh, it, it involves a lot of things that uh, protect the human health, uh, such as meat inspections, zoonotic diseases, things of that nature. So uh, veterinary medicine encompasses a, a, a whole realm of, of areas. Loving animals is the number one first minimal uh, requirement for going into this profession. But there's an awful lot more that goes into it besides just loving animals. There's incredibly uh, detailed science, hard work, long hours, dedication to a career that um, is, is quite consuming of your lifestyle. Um, so get to know what the profession's really all about beyond just the fact that we love animals and get to spend time with animals. The field of public health veterinary work is hugely important to us humans as well as to our animal companions. Most public health workers, who are often behind the scenes, are dedicated to One Health, a concept inviting collaboration with human health professionals. Public health veterinarians advise on policies that protect us from many infectious diseases or outbreaks that may affect animals and their humans. Massachusetts has very strict rabies vaccine regulations. We will talk to Mike Cahill, the Director of the Division of Animal Health at the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. As the Director of the Division of Animal Health, I'm responsible for ensuring the health and safety of the domestic animal population within the state. And as our eyes and ears in the field, we do rely on the veterinarians practicing within the state to inform us of any issues that they seem uh, that they see or come across so that you know if we see a potential problem that could spread and affect other animals it's something that we can work together to resolve. Well it's certainly our responsibility to respond to an outbreak and and again that's where the cooperation with the veterinary community comes in. We do rely on the vets that are out there practicing to be our eyes and ears and if they see something that they suspect that could be a a larger problem or you know or certainly uh, the beginnings of an infectious contagious disease outbreak we need them to report those issues to us so that we can respond in an appropriate manner work with other veterinarians in, in the area to see if the problems spread beyond that that situation and uh, and to ensure that the fewest number of animals and in turn their owners uh, are affected we do have some of the strictest vaccination protocols for rabies uh, in the country and it's that that primary series that we require it's two shots between nine and twelve months apart uh, when we feel that uh, based on that protocol the animals are having their best opportunity to build appropriate protection and be granted the long-term immunity that the that the shots can provide we have unfortunately had a couple of vaccination failures earlier this spring so despite our best efforts we know that the vaccines aren't hundred percent effective but given those only two cases in the last 15 years we've been dealing with the disease, uh, we feel the protocols have been, have been pretty appropriate and, and have been protecting the companion animal population at large. Thank you for sampling our veterinary world with us. We hope you enjoyed seeing these wonderful doctors at work behind the scenes. Your local veterinarian and the Massachusetts Veterinary Medical Association are here to help you keep your animal friends healthy and safe so you can enjoy those animals.